Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today um, to talk about energy and our energy future and in, in a positive light. Um, I, I will be speaking this evening more about the evidence for a near-term global oil production peak. Uh, I'll just touch on that uh, uh, in, in this lecture. However, um, I, I think we have to start with uh, this, the same premise in either case, which is that energy is really what makes human societies go. Uh, energy is the, is, the, is the basis for all life, in fact, and most energy originates, energy that we use originates from the sun. Uh, we've been using energy as human beings ever since we've been human, and even before that, and our particular genius as human beings has been to find ways of harvesting ever-increasing amounts of energy from the environment. Going back to uh, hunter-gatherer times, most of our energy came in the form of food and most of our energy expenditure was in the form of muscle power. <clears throat> As we developed plant domestication, agriculture, animal domestication, we increased the um, a, amount of energy that we could use and we diversified our ways of using energy. We harvested energy from uh, the muscles of our draft animals. We hitched horses and oxen to plows and carts and so on. And through all of this, we were dealing with the fact that it always cost energy to get energy. For example, keeping horses required us to grow food for the horses. And so there was uh, always hopefully a little positive energy, energy differential between the amount of energy it required for us to adopt these new technologies and the little bit of net energy gain that we could get from using them. Now, <clears throat> something happened a couple of hundred years ago to send this process of gradual cultural transformation, technological transformation, and, and societal growth into hyperdrive. And we call that the Industrial Revolution. Uh, most of us, I, ten, I think, tend to think of the Industrial Revolution as having been mostly about invention of new technologies. And certainly it was largely about that. But the other half of the Industrial Revolution we tend to sort of take for granted, which is what were those technologies running on because most of the tools that we've invented over the last 200 years are tools that use energy. And of course, primarily we're talking about fossil fuels. That's what enabled the Industrial Revolution to happen. Most of the inventions that have happened over the last couple of hundred years, uh, most of these inventions are tools that we have created to use the abundant cheap, versatile fossil fuel energy that we have started tapping just in, in relatively recent times. And of course, that fossil fuel energy represents <clears throat> concentrated power, concentrated by the forces of nature over millions of years. Uh, oil, for example, most of most of the oil that we use today was created during two relatively brief periods of global warming about 90 and 150 million years ago. Uh, and that global warming created conditions for population blooms of algae and plankton, which then sank to the bottoms of primordial seas and lakes, were covered over by sediment, and cooked again over millions of years. So that created a kind of energy bank account that we've been drawing down over the last few decades, really, at ever-increasing rates. Now, once we discovered fossil fuels, it was almost inevitable we would have become addicted to them, as our president has recently and famously said, because of the enormous economic benefits 
of, of these fuels, and particularly oil, which has been the most energy dense and uh, convenient fossil fuel to use. This is a, a graph of the work done in the US economy and the source of that work, the energy source of that work. In 1850, about 65% of the work being done in the US economy was being done by muscle power, uh, animal mu muscle power to be more precise, another 17 or 18% human muscle power. And of course in 1850 we're talking about a lot of that muscle power coming from kidnapped Africans, indentured Chinese, and so on. Uh, yes, slavery was also about harnessing energy from uh, other human beings. <clears throat> Only about uh, 17 or 18 percent of the work being done in the U.S. economy in 1850 was being done by fuel-fed machinery. And most of that fuel, actually, was wood. We had an abundance of wood at that time. Uh, by 1880, the majority of the uh, energy in the U.S. economy is coming from coal. And then uh, beginning around 1900, we switch to oil. By 1960, virtually all of the work being done in the U.S. economy is being done by fuel-fed machines. And virtually all of that energy is from fossil fuel sources. Now, why were fossil fuels so attractive? Well, think about it. Maybe you've had the experience of uh, running out of gas in your car and having to push your car off to the side of the road. That's fairly hard work if you have to push your car, say, 20 feet or so. Imagine pushing your car 20 miles. That's, of course, the service that we get from a single gallon of gasoline, for which we're still paying only, what, two less than $2.50. That represents roughly uh, six weeks of hard human labor. So six weeks of hard human labor, energy equivalent for $2.50, what a bargain. No wonder we've become dependent on this stuff. And no wonder we've substituted human labor and animal muscle power with fossil fuels wherever we possibly can. In fact, if the services performed for us on a daily basis by fuel-fed machinery had to be done by human muscle power, once again, uh, how many humans would it take? Well, on average, about 300 for the typical North American lifestyle. Each of us has about 300 energy slaves trailing around after us, washing our clothes, picking up our socks, and pushing us around in medical, metal vehicles and so on. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned a few moments ago, our, our, our president has recently said that we are addicted to oil. And certainly that's the case. Uh, the question is now, what will be the way to reduce or eliminate that addiction? And that's, that's where I hope to go in the remainder of the talk. Now this is a picture of, of where we are uh, currently in terms of global oil production. Uh, peak oil is a phenomenon that is increasingly well studied. It's not a theory, it's, it's simply something that happens to oil producing wells and countries and whole regions. Uh, the US, of course, was the first important oil producing nation to, to peak in 1970. Before that time, the U.S. had been the world's foremost oil producing nation, even the world's foremost oil exporting nation for many decades. So we saw it happen in the U.S. and it will happen for the world as a whole. Almost no one uh, disputes that point. There is some disagreement as to when that's likely to happen. This is one projection from the Association for the Study of Peak Oil. And it shows the history of, of how we became more and more dependent on oil. Uh, this shows also the uh, uh, phenomenon of the uh, uh, oil shocks of the 1970s, the first oil shock in 73 when uh, OPEC uh, embargoed uh, oil sales to the U.S. and then the second oil shock in 1979 with the fall of the Shah of Iran. And both of these had substantial economic impacts and particularly in the second instance this oil shock resulted in policy changes. We actually start, started to adopt efficiency measures and to pursue renewable energy sources here in this country. We reduced speed limits from 75 to 55 miles an hour on interstate highways. We saw the beginnings of the CAFE standards. 
And people spontaneously started buying smaller and more fuel efficient cars, insulating their homes better and so on. And as you can see, that had a real impact. We actually used less oil on a yearly basis for many years. Then when the price of oil sank back down to historic low levels in the early 19 or mid 1980s, then of course we, we gave up a lot of those efficiency gains. We uh, raised the uh, speed limits on the highways back up to 60, 65, 70 miles an hour. And, uh, and since then we have increased our reliance on oil uh, this slide also shows the difference between regular conventional oil and the non-conventional petroleum sources, deep water oil, natural gas liquids and condensates, uh, heavy oil from Venezuela, the tar sands from Canada, and so on, all of which are much more expensive to produce. And as you can see, we're relying on them increasingly because regular conventional oil globally has probably already peaked. And in fact, there is some controversy as to whether all petroleum liquids may already have peaked. This projection shows a peak right around 2008 or 2010. And more and more analysts are uh, coming to see that, that that's a strong likelihood. Evidence for that includes the fact that uh, global oil discoveries have been declining for the past 40 years. Uh, this is what we saw in the US. Discoveries peaked in 1930. Extraction peaked in 1970, about a 40 year time lag. And for the world as a whole, uh, as ExxonMobil is telling us, uh, discoveries peaked around 1964 and uh, have been declining generally since then, a little sawtooth pattern here. Now this only goes up to the year 2000, 1999 and 2000 were very good years for discovery. Since then, uh, the latest year we have data for is 2005. The numbers just came out. And uh, totals for 2005 were 6.5 billion barrels of oil total discovery for the year. And we used globally about 30 billion barrels. So that's a ratio of about six to one. In other words, we discover one new barrel of oil for every six that we extract and use. Um, now, before 1980, we were discovering more oil every year than we used. Since then, we've been extracting more than we discover. <clears throat> so, when exactly will the peak occur? Nobody knows, but uh, we are seeing historically high uh, prices uh, these days, historically low uh, um, spare capacity. Currently, uh, Saudi Arabia claims to have about a million and a half barrels a day of spare production capacity. We, we use currently 84 million barrels a day of oil. But that's, uh, that's a matter of some controversy in and of itself because claims are being made that Saudi Arabia may itself be at or very close to its all-time production peak. All we can be sure of is that the peak will arrive at some point and that we may be very close to that point. So what are the alternatives? Where shall we turn? Uh, this is a, a picture of, of where the United States is currently getting its energy. And oil is our main energy source in the country. It's virtually all of our transportation fuel. We also use it for uh, home heating, for in chemicals, plastics, and so on. But uh, the, the transportation sector is entirely dependent on oil. And of course, transportation is extremely important for our modern American way of life and our economy. Uh, natural gas is our second most important fuel, and tied with that virtually is coal, then nuclear, and then the renewables. Uh, and this is a breakout of some of the renewable sources. So let's, let's go through the, the list quickly and see what the most likely alternatives are. Now, when, when we first encounter the idea of peak oil, the fact that uh, oil extraction consumption is constrained by purely geological factors that have nothing to do with uh, political decisions or economic decisions. The, the natural tendency, I think for everyone, is to m immediately go to the supply side and say, well, what will be the alternative sources of fuel to enable us to maintain exactly the same way of life that we're enjoying today? And my conclusion is that there is no 
source or combination of sources of alternative fuels, liquid transportation fuels, that will enable us to maintain exactly the same way of life that we enjoy today. Now, why, why do I arrive at that conclusion? Well, um, for a long time, many uh, environmentalists have been proposing substituting natural gas for oil because natural gas is the simplest hydrocarbon and it burns very cleanly either using natural gas directly in vehicles or uh, perhaps even better according to some, using natural gas to make hydrogen and then burning the hydrogen in vehicles uh, either directly in internal combustion engines or via fuel cells. The problem here is that natural gas is itself, of course, a depleting fossil fuel and that's a problem not so much globally yet, but especially here in the United States and in the rest of North America for that matter. Uh, natural gas extraction has peaked in North America. Uh, the U.S. is importing more and more of its natural gas. We're getting about 17% from Canada right now. Canada exports 60% of its natural gas to the U.S. and Canada's natural gas production is also in decline. Now, Canada is obliged by the terms of, of North American Free Trade Agreement to continue exporting the same proportion of its natural gas to the U.S. in perpetuity. Not all Canadians are happy with that arrangement, as you can imagine, because Canadians heat their homes with natural gas, and Canada, like Vermont, is kind of a cold place part of the year. So, <clears throat> whenever I give talks in Canada, I always ask, my audiences, do you think the United States would invade your country over its natural resources? And uh, so far, I've, I, I don't think I've seen an exception to this. Every hand in the audience goes up. <laughs> um, so natural gas is itself a problem. We will be able to get some relief from liquefied natural gas, importing it from other countries in tankers. But will that give us much more uh, security as a nation in terms of, of uh, geopolitical security? The, now we, we're importing two thirds of our oil right now from countries like Saudi Arabia, well also from Canada, but countries like Venezuela and Nigeria and other Middle Eastern countries. And most Americans, according to polls, are uneasy with that. We feel that that's a, a national security liability or vulnerability. So do we really want to be importing half of our natural gas also from countries like Russia or Egypt? Um, the reality of the situation is that we're probably facing declining natural gas supplies even with imports. So natural gas is, is its own category of problem. It's not a solution to our addiction to oil. How about coal? It is possible to gasify coal and then take those gases and turn them into a liquid fuel, very high quality diesel fuel. Uh, this is already being done in uh, South Africa by Sassel Corporation and I visited South Africa. I've spoken to the executives of, of Sassel Corporation. They're currently producing 150,000 barrels a day of this uh, synthetic diesel fuel from their high quality coal reserves in South Africa. Now, South Africa is still Im importing 450,000 barrels of regular crude oil per day from Saudi Arabia and Iran. So even in the country that has the most highly developed coal to liquids technology and lots of high quality coal, they're still not able to be self-sufficient with that resource. Uh, China is, is uh, planning to build some coal to liquid coal to liquids uh, plants uh, with technology licensed from the Sassel Corporation over the next few years. Uh, the total price tag, if we were to go coal to liquids entirely in this country and substitute coal for all of our oil, about $30 trillion. Uh, now, coal also is another depleting resource. We're told constantly that we have hundreds of years of coal there's a footnote to that statement always that we tend to ignore. The footnote is at current rates of consumption. But if we're planning to substitute coal for oil, then we're not talking about current rates of consumption. We're talking about dramatically expanded rates of consumption. Also, not all of that coal is of particularly good quality. 
So once we subtract the coal, that's probably never going to be economically viable. And then fig figure in expanded extraction rates, and then add to that the fact that coal extraction is probably going to be sub sub subject to a Hubbard curve, just like oil, so that you know, we can't expect to con continue increasing the rate of extraction of coal and increasing it until the very day when we run out, which is Friday, and then suddenly on Saturday there's no more coal. That's ridiculous, of course. What will happen is a kind of bell-shaped curve where once we've gotten the low-hanging fruit, once we've gotten the high-quality, easy access coal, then the rate of extraction will begin to decline. Once we factor that in, then how much coal do we have? Well, probably, according to a study done for the U.S. Department of Energy, about 30 years before we reach a Hubbard peak of coal extraction. So to build immensely expensive new technologies to extract coal and transform it into liquid transportation fuels will, of course, that, of course, will take time. By the time we finish that project, probably we would be close to or at the Hubbard curve of coal. Not much point in going that, down that route. Well, how about nuclear electric power? Well, we could build more nuclear reactors, certainly, but that's electricity. And we don't have 200 million cars in this country and trucks that run on electricity. So at the very least, we would have to change out the entire vehicle fleet with electric cars and trucks or use the electricity to produce hydrogen by electrolyzing water, which adds inefficiencies and expenses to the, the whole proposition. And of course, even if, if we do that, we still have to change out the entire transportation fleet. Um, and the price of uranium seems to be going up. So the nuclear electric power, uh, I expect we'll be seeing more of it in this country, but as a direct solution to the problem of peak oil, I think, uh, is a long shot. The renewables, uh, this 6% slice here includes uh, uh, mostly hydroelectric power, which we can increase to a certain extent here in uh, the United States, but not, uh, not arbitrarily. Many of our rivers are already thoroughly dammed, uh, maybe in more ways than one, I don't know. And uh, this 47% biomass largely consists of people burning wood in their fireplaces. Uh, this 2% wind and 1% solar, uh, of course, we're, this isn't 2% of the entire uh, energy pie. This is 2% of this 6% slice, and the same with the solar. So currently, what we're getting from solar and wind is minuscule. If we added the two together, we would be at, at much, much less than 1% of our total energy budget. Those can be grown and should be grown. And in fact, we're seeing some uh, interesting new technologies coming online with both solar and wind, vertical axis wind uh, turbines that can be used in urban areas, new kinds of, of solar films, uh, both uh, 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 new kinds of metals and also dyes that, that have photoelectric properties and promise to be more efficient and much less expensive than traditional silicon cells. But those are, are not yet commercialized. We're, we're looking at probably at least 10 years before those are uh, widely available. And again, they produce electricity. I think the best we can do with solar and wind, at least over the next 25 or 30 years, is to make up for the decline in natural gas by replacing natural gas and coal in electricity generation. Because we, we will be facing uh, substantial shortfalls in electricity generation as a result of mostly problems with natural gas in the years ahead. Uh, this is particularly going to affect California where we get, uh, in my state, 51% of our electricity from natural gas. For the, for the country as a whole, it's a much smaller percentage, but still uh, our grids are in many cases pretty well maxed out and and natural gas is, is important for supplying uh, uh, peak loads. So 
if we can replace natural gas with renewables, we'll, we'll be doing well. How about liquid transportation fuels, biofuels, uh, biodiesel, ethanol? Here we have a number of, uh, of challenges, uh, one of which is the energy return on energy invested. And this is a, a controversial point because studies have come out on both sides, some saying that biofuels have a net energy positive yield um, and other studies saying that they don't, in fact, that there's, there's, it takes more energy to produce a gallon of ethanol, whether it's from uh, corn or switchgrass or uh, uh, sugarcane then the ethanol will give us at the end of the day. As long as that remains a controversy, I think uh, we would be foolish to, to, uh, in, to assume that ethanol or biodiesel will be able to solve our liquid fuels problem in this country. And in fact, my concern globally is that as liquid transportation fuels become more scarce and expensive, the economic incentive will be for farmers especially in less industrialized countries, to grow fuel rather than food. And we could, in fact, see millions of people starving so that a few thousand people can drive their cars. <clears throat> My conclusion is that there is no supply-side magic elixir, that what we will have to do is do the best we can with alternative supply, but concentrate primarily on reducing demand for energy as a whole and especially for liquid transportation fuels. Uh, and there are a lot of strategies for doing that. And most, if not all of those strategies, I would argue, ultimately can lead to a society and a way of life that is more successful, more enjoyable than what we experience today. Now, where are we going to have to look for ways to economize on our energy usage? Well, I, I'd suggest we have to look first where we're using the most energy. Now, it's easy enough for us to change out our light bulbs, change uh, incandescent light bulbs for compact fluorescence, and it's a good idea. Everyone should do it. But that's not where we use most of our energy. Where we use most of our energy is in driving, home heating, and eating. And those, those hit a little closer to home. It's a little, a little more challenging to think about how we can save energy in those areas. But uh, our, our entire agricultural system is overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels, the way we run it today. Uh, we use fuels in tractors and other farm equipment. We use fossil fuels, natural gas primarily, to make uh, nitrogen fertilizer, and then we use oil primarily to make agric other agricultural chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, and so on. And then we transport food in ever larger quantities, ever further distances, again, with oil. This has created a, an agricultural system that is profoundly unsustainable, and it's created an agricultural way of life that many farmers are, are not happy with because they're reduced to being what could be called bio serfs. They, sim they simply follow directions on the packages of the pesticides and, and fertilizers. And the, the art of farming, the, 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 the livelihood of farming that, that once was known by millions of people in this country has largely evaporated. That will have to change. And I think that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> we, we will all be eating organic food in 100 years' time, one way or the other, because there will simply be no choice. Uh, but again, I think that's a good thing, and, and it, we'll be much better off if we make that choice deliberately and proactively sooner rather than simply wait for our current agricultural system to fail before we choose to adapt it. Uh, driving is our main use, typically, uh, of, of oil. How, much, how many of us actually enjoy getting in the car every day and driving? Uh, 
Well, I know some of us do, and if, particularly if you have some really cool car, I suppose it could be uh, a, a real hit to get in your, you know, 1938 Cord or <laughs> some exotic car that you've paid uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for. Yes, but that's not what most of us do. Most of us are forced to get in our car to commute because we have no other option. Here in the United States, we talk about the love affair with the automobile, but the, the stark reality is that we used to have good public transportation in this country. Our public transportation ridership hit its peak in the 1940s and has been declining ever since. Why? Because General Motors, Firestone, and Standard Oil of California colluded to buy all of the tra public transportation infrastructure, well, not all of it, but the lion's share of it, to buy it and destroy it so that people would have no choice but to own and drive cars. And this is not a conspiracy theory. They were actually brought to court, and General Motors was forced to pay a fine, by golly, of $1. That'll teach them a lesson. <clears throat> so people like public transportation where it's available, where it's affordable, and where it's safe. If we build it, they will come. And it's, it's sad, it's tragic, in fact, that over the past several decades, we've taken hundreds of billions of dollars and put them into building highways and highways only. The US interstate highway system is the single largest public works program in the history of the world. Think what else we could have done with that money, with that investment capital. Well, we're going to have to do something else in the future, and I think we'll be much better off because of it. And heating our homes. Um, we have extremely inefficient uh, housing infrastructure in this country. We've, we've done a little bit better over the past two or three decades, but we could do far better uh, than we are doing now and use much less fuel as a result. Would that compromise our enjoyment of life, our happiness? Far from it, I think, because it would make us much less dependent on these depleting fossil fuel resources. Uh, just from the standpoint of transportation, uh, and, and these, this slide and the previous one were from uh, France, uh, so they show a little bit different picture than, than what we have available to us here in the U.S., but nevertheless, it's instructive. Uh, the least efficient form of transportation we've ever devised is the short-haul plane, uh, say a commuter plane from you know, New York to Washington, D.C., for example. Pretty inefficient. Uh, Long-distance plane, fully loaded, is actually more efficient than an automobile from a purely energetic standpoint. Some, some other problems with that from uh, um, pollution and so on, but from a pure energy standpoint, the personal automobile is right up there with the least efficient forms of transportation we have ever devised. At the other end of the spectrum is the bicycle, the most efficient form of transportation ever invented by human beings. Now, there is the spectrum. Guess what we need less of and what we need more of. Uh, pretty simple. Along the way, we have things like city buses, commuting train, national train, Paris Metro. Uh, I highly recommend that. And uh, TGV, high-speed high train. Walking is la actually less efficient from an energy standpoint than riding your bicycle. So we need to redesign our city. We need to make them more walkable. We need to provide public transportation in our urban areas. And in doing so, we will have much more enjoyable places to live. Do we really enjoy the strip mall uh, suburban form of development that, that has been created for us over the last 20, 30, 40 years? An example of that is a, a place called Village example of the opposite of that is a place called Village Homes in Davis, California. It was a development that was uh, designed a couple of decades ago specifically to be ecological and energy efficient. So rather than wastewater streaming through sewer systems and, and so on, the wastewater is, or, or the stormwater is captured and, uh, and 
waters fruit and nut trees, which are planted all over the place, and people harvest the fruit and nuts. And, uh, <clears throat> and the homes are extremely energy efficient. Uh, the neighborhoods are arranged in such a way that people actually get to know each other. The problem with village homes is that developers don't want to recreate it. Why? Because people want to stay there. Rather than wanting to move periodically and sell their homes, thereby providing income to more, more development and uh, more mortgages, more fi home financing and so on, people just stay there and pay off their homes. And so nobody makes money off of it. So nobody wants to recreate village homes because it's successful. So we have an, an economic paradigm in this country that forces us to reproduce the least satisfying forms of housing infrastructure. Isn't that interesting? Um, <clears throat> now this is, this is a ration coupon from World War II. And during World War II, we, we rationed fuel, nylon stockings, car tires, all sorts of things. Uh, and folks went along with that because we understood that we were facing a common enemy, that this was a crisis in our national history. And if we pulled together, we could make it through this crisis. We'd already been through a Great Depression. And people were not only willing to comply with these regulations, in fact, many people who are still alive look back on that time as a time when, yes, th things were difficult, but there, it was kind of a shining moment, you know, the greatest generation. People were proud of what they, what they achieved during that time. Well, I think we're, we're approaching a similar kind of crisis situation, a sim similar national challenge now with regard to peak oil. And I think some similar kinds of solutions are required and, uh, and inevitable one way or another. Like victory gardens. The victory gardens, by the way, were not initially mandated by the government. The victory garden movement was spontaneous. People started growing vegetables in their front lawns and in golf courses and so on as a way of contributing to the collective effort. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually tried to suppress the Victory Garden movement because they felt it was getting in the way of, of commercial agriculture. When it became clear that they couldn't suppress the Victory Garden movement, the USDA, of course, took credit for it and, and then began advertising it. Uh, I think we're, we're going to need Victory Gardens. We're going to need for, uh, we're going to need common folks to start digging up their lawns and growing more of their own food. And we're going to need, I think, to ration our remaining fossil fuels, particularly oil. Yes, uh, we could let the market ration our remaining oil. Uh, doing so, I think we would see a situation where uh, it would be very difficult for poorer people to maintain uh, their, their, their access to even the little bit of oil they absolutely need in order to survive. Whereas if we issue uh, qu tradable quotas, then not only would everybody have access to what they a absolutely needed, but then folks who didn't use their entire quota, who were more energy conserving, the real conservatives, would be able to sell their extra quotas to the folks who just dearly love to drive their monster truck up and down the street at 60 miles an hour. But those folks would have to pay extra for that privilege. So we'd see a subtle but very real ongoing transfer of wealth from the energy guzzlers to the energy misers. And I think this would be a good way to arrange it. <clears throat> Currently, um, we're seeing communities, municipalities all across North America waking up to the challenge of peak oil and beginning to form citizens groups, uh, committees being set up by city councils, boards of supervisors, and so on, to address the problem of peak oil. And this is getting people thinking, I think, in very creative and instructive ways about things like food security, water security, the, the quality and health of the local economy. Um, <clears throat> 
I, I work with a number of these citizens groups, and my students at New College uh, do as well. And I have to say, I've never seen such a revitalization of commitment to uh, local politics and, uh, and civic life as is occurring as a result of people's response to the, what appears to be a devastating problem, which is peak oil. Uh, <clears throat> There are, I think, a lot of that we can learn from. I've already mentioned these. Uh, in South Africa, um, uh, there's the example of the, what, what are called the taxis, which are, in fact, little Toyota vans, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of them, that are like little private bus services. And uh, particularly the, the uh, uh, black South Africans who live in townships who can uh, can't afford to own cars, uh, take the taxis to and from the city. Now, the, I, I rode in one of the taxis, uh, stayed overnight in the township and rode in one of the taxis while I was in South Africa. And it's, it's kind of a harrowing experience because the drivers are, are not very well trained uh, <laughs> or very responsible in many cases. However, it's a great idea. I mean, we, we think of buses as these giant lumbering vehicles that, that run around usually half full at best and aren't all that efficient, actually, from an energy standpoint. And most people don't want to ride them because the, the, the schedules are not very uh, reasonable and, and so on. But what if, instead of that, we had radio or cell phone controlled, computer controlled, uh, mini buses that could pick you up where you are and take you to where you want to go with a half dozen other people. Much more efficient. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes now about the example of Cuba. Cuba is not in many ways very analogous to the United States. Different government, different size of country, different level of economic development and so on. However, I think Cuba is uh, an excellent, well, it's, it's the best example we have of a country that has gone through an energy famine and lived to tell the tale. Uh, back in 1989, Cuba was more dependent on oil for agriculture than the US was. Cuban farmers were using more agricultural chemicals, uh, petroleum-based chemicals, per acre than American farmers were. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, and imports of cheap oil from the Soviet Union were cut off, this was an economic and agricultural catastrophe for Cuba. And the nation came very close to succumbing as a, as a coherent political unit. What happened, in, in fact, was that a whole generation of Cuban children grew up malnourished. Every Cuban, on average, lost about 30 pounds during the special period. That's, that's how serious a problem it was. However, Cuba responded to the crisis and in some very creative ways. First of all, there were some uh, ecological agronomists at Cuban universities who had been arguing for years to make Cuban agriculture more organic. Uh, and by and large, they weren't being listened to. Then when the crisis came, uh, the government called these folks in and said, what shall we do? You know, what would you advise? And so these folks already had a pretty well thought out plan. Uh, also a number of permaculture teachers and activists from Australia arrived in, in uh, Cuba early on and taught the Cubans a lot of permaculture techniques that were then quickly adopted and taught throughout the population. So permaculture, uh, Cuba, in a sense, in a sense became a, a permaculture nation. <clears throat> Just some of the statistics here, I've already mentioned some of them. Uh, major decrease in material standard of living during the uh, special period. Uh, yes, so what, what Cuba did was to take the large state-owned farms and break them up into smaller, privately owned co-ops and move people out of the cities into the countryside to farm, 
Uh, and of course, a lot of these people didn't know how to farm, so they had to set up schools and turn the curriculum of many of their ex existing schools over toward education for agriculture. At the same time, uh, there was a promotion of urban agriculture in uh, cities like Havana, so that uh, more and more of the food was being produced closer to where it was being consumed. Uh, traffic cops in Havana found a different occupation. Rather than st just stopping people for speeding, uh, they began to stop people if they had empty seats in their cars so that they would have to wait until enough hitchhikers showed up to fill up those empty seats. Uh, <clears throat> let's, let's get to some, uh, this, is a, well, this is just some details about uh, vo involuntary vegetarianism. The Cuban diet has become much less meat-centered uh, and um, there's very little obesity in Cuba now due to the healthier diet and more physical labor. So some, even though this sounds on the surface like they went through a catastrophe, in fact, the Cuban people are very proud of what they've achieved over the last uh, 15 years and uh, generally are much healthier as a result. This is a, a picture of what they call the camel. Uh, they basically took a semi uh, tractor and turned it into a people mover. These hold, uh, as it says here, about 300 passengers and it's an extremely efficient way of moving, moving people around. Not necessarily a very comfortable one, but uh, as you can see they've, they've, they've been very uh, very innovative with what they, what they have available. Uh, <clears throat> urban farms, as I mentioned, are designed for hand labor and uh, you know you don't need so many parking lots if you don't have as many cars. So uh, in addition to tearing up parking lots you can just build uh, container gardens right right on top of them. Um, also one strategy that was necessary in order to get people to move out of the cities into the countryside to, to participate in food production was to raise salaries of agricultural workers. Uh, and in fact, this is still true, many farmers in, in Cuba earn more than, than doctors or engineers. And of course, Cuba is still turning out very high rates uh, and, and qualities of, of medical and engineering personnel. <coughs> In many cases, uh, traction animals have replaced uh, motorized farm machinery. Rooftop gardening in the cities uh, includes not just raising uh, vegetable food, but also uh, small animals, chickens, hamsters, rabbits. Uh, this is a picture in downtown Havana. Now, is, is the U.S. going to do exactly the same thing that Cuba did? Of course not. As I mentioned earlier, we have a very different economy, very different infrastructure, very different culture, and so on. In some ways, I suppose you could say the Cubans have an advantage over Americans in that they had a centralized decision-making system that enabled them to uh, make a transition in a coordinated, speedy way. It might be more difficult for us. On the other hand, the U.S. has a lot going for it. We've actually done more research on renewable energy than the rest of the world put together. Uh, most of the renewable energy technologies that are being implemented in countries like Germany and Spain and Japan were in fact developed and researched here in the United States. It's kind of tragic in a way that, that we have not implemented the very technologies that we've developed. Uh, we, we have... <clears throat> still a relatively wealthy country where we can afford still to make the investment in the transition in infrastructure if we begin that transition immediately. And Americans are extremely ingenious and adaptable people as we've shown again and again throughout our history including through the Great Depression and two world wars. Uh, so there's no reason to despair in all of this. In fact, uh, I believe that 
over the course of two, three, four decades, we could redesign and reshape this country in a way that would make it far more livable and satisfying in every respect and use a small fraction of the energy that we're using today in doing so. Right now, Sweden is in the process of doing exactly this. The Swedish Prime Minister has acknowledged the problem of peak oil and uh, Sweden has uh, set the goal of 2020 as the date by which they hope to be completely uh, free of oil dependence. Why not set a similar goal in this country? Uh, Cuba, once again, the, the Cuban uh, government has declared 2006 the year of the energy transition uh, because Cuba is also concerned about the problem of peak oil and uh, President Castro has set the goal of re reducing Cuban energy usage by two-thirds. And remember, Cuba is already using energy at what, about one-fifteenth the per capita rate of Americans. Americans are using energy at about twice the per capita rate of Europeans and Japanese. So as you can see, there's lots of room for us to reduce our energy consumption without loss of uh, quality of life. And in fact, uh, as, I've, as I've said, I believe that it's in, in fact possible for it, us to increase our quality of life substantially in the process of making this this necessary energy transition. In the end, we have no choice. So why not make a virtue out of necessity? Thank you. <laughs>